Hello, everybody. Thanks for hopping on. We're doing happy hour. Even though it's the weekend, it is still happy hour. Hey, Cake Bread. I'm just put pinning here the discussion and the topic so we can make sure that when people join, everybody knows um, what we are discussing today. So I don't know why my thing keeps flipping around. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hopping on. Happy Saturday. This is um, a really great way to spend uh, some time together before dinner time. So thank you all for hopping on. And of course, we are going to have a really awesome and massive giveaway today. So if you are just joining on, welcome everybody. Um, today we are doing a happy hour with uh, cake bread sellers out of Napa. Um, and we are giving away a $100 Visa gift card at the end. So I hope you entered. I believe my post was on Tuesday. I have the spreadsheet here, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to be talking about some really, really incredible benchmark Napa Valley wines today. And um, if there are any questions about things that I don't go over, uh, we do have cake bread sellers here with us. Uh, please feel free to pop a question in the question box here. Um, and you know what, if you're opening some cake bread, please feel free to also uh, request to join the video for later um, so that, you know, we can hop on and, and talk a little bit about your wine if, if that's what you were able to pick up. So I am currently double fisting right now because when am I not? Uh, I feel like every time I hop on here, I'm always telling you guys that I, I'm drinking two wines at once. Um, but I am currently drinking the 2018 Sauvignon Blanc. So I will go ahead and show you what that looks like. So here's the bottle right here if you guys are interested. I also had linked this on wine.com earlier in the week and I'm happy to do so again if you guys are interested. So um, yeah, let's get started. So thank you again. It's, uh, you know, it's just a couple minutes past 5.30, so let's get moving. So. Basically, like I was mentioning before, to really understand cake bread sellers, you really have to understand Napa Valley, right? Because these wines are are some something I would consider a benchmark, as I mentioned before, of Napa. Uh, these are some classic ex examples, classic styles, um, and beautiful expressions that I think everybody should have in their collection. Um, so it's important to know that the journey here with cake bread started in 1972, when Jack and Dolores cake bread uh, were shooting photographs for Nathan Croman's Treasury of American Wines. So. They, they scoped out this ranch in Rutherford, right? And they basically took their commission check from working on that project and bought this ranch. Um, and it was there that the, uh, the AXR1 rootstock was planted for uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So it was a 22 acre parcel. So that's kind of where, where the adventure begins. And I believe the first wine was released in 1973. But to, to think that, you know, you're on this, you're on this job and you're, you're taking photographs and you use your entire commission check and say, you know what? I want to buy, I want to buy a vineyard. I want to buy, I want to do this. I want to make it happen. Uh, it's super inspiring. It's super motivating. And it's a true tale of just somebody really following their dreams and following their passions. So it's definitely something that we can all kind of look up to, especially in these times now where we have all this time to reflect. Well, not all of us, but a lot of us have a lot of time here to kind of reflect on what our lives were before this and kind of think about how we can move forward and the things that would make us happy, right? So this was really a, uh, a motivational thing for me to read and I really, really appreciated their story and I'm glad that they that they shared it with us. So um, the website, the Cake Bread Sellers website provides like a really amazing historical timeline. Uh, if you guys are interested in kind of how they built up from that moment in 1972 to now, um, they you'll find out about partnerships that they had. There was a partnership with Keenan Winery back then. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Keenan. Uh, I did try Keenan for the first time this past year, actually, and love them. Um, and they also worked with Mandavi's Enologist. Um, and and so 
The timeline also talks about when all of these vineyard plots or ranches, as they call them, uh, were purchased. So it's something really cool uh, for you guys to check out on your own time because I guarantee that you will learn a lot and really, really have an amazing understanding for these wines. Um, so as I mentioned before, when we're talking about the cake bread ranches, we're really we're really talking about some of the best sites in Napa. Uh, so it's important to understand why these grapes thrive in certain places. You can't just say, "Oh, it's Napa," and just assume like, "Oh, it's just Cabernet," and it's it's good for Cabernet because it's hot. Like that is just not that is not the whole story, and that's definitely not a, a way to really understand and grasp uh, what the region is about. So it's it's so much more than that. Um, so when we when we look at Napa on the map, we have the Mayakama Mountains, um, which form a boundary between Napa and Sonoma County. Um, and on the eastern side, we have the Vacay Mountains that separate Napa Valley from the northern part of the Central Valley. So the most significant influences are the morning fogs and the cool afternoon breezes that are blowing off from the San Pablo Bay, which is the northern extension of the San Francisco Bay. Uh, and they moderate temperatures in the vineyard south of the valley. So here we are speaking about Los Coneros, right? And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, uh, some really beautiful wines there. Um, the Los Coneros AVA is where cake bread grows Chardonnay. So I actually have the bottle here. This is the 2018 Chardonnay. Uh, we'll talk about tasting notes in a little bit. Uh, because I really want to go through those with you. Um, but so the cooling influences here along, uh, allow for a long, slow, steady ripening process. Uh, so this assures that the Chardonnay gets adequate sugar, but still retains a really, really nice mouth-watering acidity. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than a flabby Chardonnay. Um, so, you know, growing grapes in certain areas in Napa Valley uh, definitely help out with these kinds of things that we all love and look for. Uh, case in point, you know, San Pablo Bay, you have those really cool air blowing through up into Los Coneros, and, and that is how we're able to have such beautiful expressions of, of Chardonnay. And there's also wonderful Pinot Noir that grows there as well. Um, cake bread grows Pinot Noir up in Anderson Valley, but we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Um, so, as you move north along the valley floor, the, the climate becomes warm enough to ripen Cabernet Sauvignon. So here you'll find the AVAs of Oakville and Rutherford, um, with the least influences coming from the Pablo Bay, so it doesn't quite get up there. Uh, Rutherford is the warmest during the day, and, and the wines are often considered to have the most power and structure. Uh, Cake Bread has ranches both in Oakville and Rutherford. Rutherford is where the main winery was when I told you guys about the history in the beginning. They bought the ranch that was their first um, first parcel 22 acre vineyard was in Rutherford. Um, so they have ranches in both of these AVAs and they're cultivating Cabernet, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, and Semillon, which is really cool because if you guys know about Bordeaux, you know that a lot of their dry white wines are actually a mix of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. And they're also, they tend to see a little bit of neutral oak, which is cool because the Sauvignon Blanc that I'm drinking now um, doesn't say anything about Semillon. However, it does say something about oak. So we'll get there in a minute, but it is absolutely delicious. I'm just gonna stop and take a sip here. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So. And if you guys have questions, like I said, I just like to get through my, my dorky stuff first because you guys know that I've never done a live where I haven't like tried to teach you something because I'm just a big nerd. So just pop them in the chat box if you do. Um, so as we keep heading our journey north, we'll run into the Calistoga ABA, which also receives some of the warmest daytime temperatures um, and can produce some of the, the most concentrated, full-bodied wines in the valley. Uh, cool air through the Chalk Hill Gap in the Maya Kama Mountains can provide some relief, um, but the cooler nighttime temps really help retain the acidity in these grapes. So that kind of diurnal swing from hot days to cool evenings, that is what grapes love. So I always talk about diurnal range. So what is the difference between day and nighttime temperatures? Uh, the, the bigger the swing, 
uh, usually, uh, in my preference, the healthier and the better expression and the more aromatics you're going to get out of those grapes. Um, so here, cake bread grows Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Petit Syrah. And if you guys know anything about Petit Verdot, you know that like Cabernet, it needs extremely warm temperatures to fully ripen, even warmer than Cabernet needs. It, it really takes the entire ripening season. It needs a lot of daytime heat. It needs a lot of direct sunlight to fully express itself. And this is a great blending grape. So a lot of times when you see something labeled Cabernet and Napa, there are some other little mixtures sprinkled in there. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. Uh, but Petit Verdot does add this beautiful kind of spice and black fruit and a little bit of uh, some more tannin. Um, so it can really, really kind of like juice up, juice up the Cabernet. Um, so the final two places that we're going to mention today are the Howell Mountain AVA and Mendocino County as I was mentioning before. So the Howell Mountain ABA has vineyards that lie above the fog line. So the fruit here is cooled by altitude. It's not cooled here by the fog rolling in through any gaps or anything like that. These vineyards are above the fog line. It is cooled by the altitude. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I love me some mountain fruit. Um, oh, sorry, I, saw, I, I my phone was not letting me see all of these comments. Thank you guys all for joining. Hello, hello, hello. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so I have like totally missed all of these comments. So hopefully I'll be able to go back and read them because I am the worst. Um, so, okay, back to my spiel. So um, yeah, we're lying above the fog line here and I absolutely love mountain fruit. So I say mountain fruit, um, you know, these are just grapes that are grown at really high altitudes that the altitude of, you know, extremely cool nights. Um, as you guys know, every, is it 200 feet? The temperature drops one degrees Fahrenheit, I, I want to say. Um, it's in my French wine scholar uh, book. Clearly I need to study. Um, but Cake bread's gotten covered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, you get this extreme drop in temperature. And so, again, you're getting this beautiful kind of, you know, morning sun and afternoon sun. But then you're getting this really cool evening and it's really like juicing it up. Get them nice and right. Keep that acidity. No one likes a flabby wine. And so when you're drinking wine that comes from a mountain like Howell Mountain, you know that you're going to have those those salivating glands activating and it's gonna be everything, basically. Yes, how Mountain, Spring Mountain, Snow Mountain, all these all these mountains, uh, mountain fruit, yeah. Go find wines that say that from those AVAs. Um, you're gonna, they're, they're really something special. Um, so here, they're mostly west facing, so they're getting exposure to that afternoon sun. Uh, and cake bread grows Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cab Franc here. So here we're kind of adding in a, a new grape. So Cab Franc, Howell Mountain. Um, so being above the fog line must help to accent some of the gentle mineral qualities of their grapes. I would have to agree. Um, I think when you when you are able to have some really cool fruit um, that is able to retain acidity, excuse me, and in their aromas, I think it also helps you open up to being able to see some of the other qualities that maybe won't jump out, uh, you know, in other situations or in other microclimates. So definitely a good point. Um, so last but not least on our travel to Napa, because I know we all wish we were in Napa Valley right now. I know I do. Um, I hate to admit this because it's like, embarrassing. I actually haven't been to Napa in like six years. Um, oh my God, that hurts. It hurts so bad to say that. Um, but I love these wines and I drink them all the time. Um, so we're going to pretend that we are still traveling up through Napa Valley. Um, so we're heading to Anderson Valley, uh, which is very cool and great for cultivating aromatic grapes and sparkling wine. Uh, so think like Gewürztraminer does really well here. There's some really great expressions of like a, 
a traditional champagne method or traditional method sparkling wine that's being made up here. I definitely need to come visit California after quarantine. That is like a must. Um, that is on the list, don't you worry. Um, so here we are cultivating Pinot Noir when we're, when we're talking about cake bread. So like I was mentioning before, Los Coneros is a great place to also grow Pinot Noir, but um, and the Anderson Valley AVA is as well, because again, it's super cool up here. Um, Pinot Noir is really finicky, so it gets just the right amount of heat, but it also gets that kind of cooler climate that it really needs to, to fully properly ripen and, and really give us those, um, the acidity and that kind of floral aromatic and you know some of those bright juicy red berry aromatics that we love from Pinot Noir. Again, it's like one of the most finicky grapes out there, so it needs a very specific climate. So again, when we're talking about cake bread, we are talking about a place that grows grapes in the most ideal places in Napa Valley where these grapes thrive. So that is the point that I'm trying to make here is that the reason why these wines are so benchmark and so quintessential Napa Valley is because they totally understand where these grapes need to grow and where they express themselves the most authentically. And so that is what translates into my wine glass. And that is what I'm so excited about. And that is why I hope you guys all have some cake bread with you as well today. And if you don't, DM me because we will figure out a way how you can how you can get some drinking some Pinot from Anderson Valley. Delicious. Okay, so uh, let's let's go to the wines, shall we? So let's start with the Sauvignon Blanc here. So I posted this the other day. Uh, excellent value, uh, you know, great price point. Uh, something that I would drink you know we're heading into you know i know it's been a little bit cold around <laughs> around the country right now uh and even down in north carolina is super chilly today but we are believe it or not heading into the nice spring summer season and uh let me tell you what this is a beautiful aperitivo wine it is a beautiful wine that could go with so many different dishes um for dinner uh and it just get it's just a total vibe right now uh I guess that's that's how I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna say, uh, because I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Drinking a white Bordeaux, but I wish I had a cake bread. When I read, when I teach you guys about this wine, you're gonna be like, oh my god, I totally need that, especially if you're drinking a white Bordeaux. Uh, so this this wine here was fermented in 78% uh, stainless steel and 22% neutral French oak. Uh, and then it was aged for five months in neutral French oak. So a lot of times when we're drinking Sauvignon Blanc from around the world, um, you know, Sancerre, Loire Valley, all over in there, um, you know, other parts of, of the U.S. and, and so forth, um, we're not seeing any oak at all because, uh, you know, a lot of people say like, well, we don't want to put any, any oak on Sauvignon Blanc because we want it to express all of its aromatics. It's a very aromatic wine, right? But when you're putting it in a little bit of neutral oak, you're not imparting any actual oak or woody flavors to the wine. You're not masking over the beautiful aromatics that Sauvignon naturally has. What you're doing is you're just giving it a really nice texture. Yes, Hey J. Rosé, exactly. Neutral oak contact for some body and complexity. It's the way it feels in your mouth. It's that weight on the palate. It's, it's that kind of... It's that complexity and texture where where you are like, okay, yeah, I'm not drinking water right now. This is definitely this definitely has some weight to it, and it and it makes it an excellent food wine as well. You know, I know I mentioned like, oh, this would be a great aperitivo wine, which it would be, but also that that little bit of added uh, neutral oak makes it excellent for things like grilled chicken or roasted chicken or any other kind of like white meats things like that, leaner meats. This this wine can definitely come to the party and definitely hang at dinner. Um, so that is what I love about this. Yeah, Sauvignon Blanc, no oak most of the time. Um, so I just wanna do like a quick, quick little tasting note here. 
So on the nose, what I love about um, Sauvignon Blancs that you find in Napa Valley is this kind of like beautiful tropical fruit. So instead of like a super limey gooseberry that maybe you'll find in, in New Zealand, which is also, you know, I like that too. You know, you, you can like all kinds of Sauvignon Blanc, you know, it just depends on what you're in the mood for. Uh, but one of the things that's really great about Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc is just that kind of ripe tropical guava fruit, passion fruit. There is a little, uh, there's a little citrus there, maybe like a, a super ripe lime. I'm not gonna call it like a lime zest or anything like that. I'm, I'm, it's very, very ripe. It's mostly tropical, ripe grapefruit. Um, yeah, and again, you don't smell oak. That's, you know, and that's not, that's not the point of why they, they put a little bit of it in neutral oak. Um, beautiful. Killer acidity. Mouth is watering. I don't know about you guys. I'm super, I'm super sensitive to acidity. And actually, I thought that that was really going to screw me up on my WSET level three blind tasting because if you ask Michael, who's here, he's always like, it's not that acidic. But I'm so, so sensitive to acidity. And so they tell you the way that you can really measure acidity in a wine is if you take a sip and kind of just like, lean forward and kind of let your mouth hang open a little bit and how fast the saliva runs to the front of your mouth can gauge the acidity in a wine um that happens to me uh with almost all wines so i i've really had to train myself and really identify that like i have a huge sensitivity to acidity from the beginning to kind of like to bring it back and and really and really kind of uh watch that um but this has again doing it now. Yeah, be careful because <laughs> you have my issue, like gross, but yeah, I've, I've lost some saliva to the floor uh, more than a few times, like super embarrassing. Um, but yeah, these beautiful tropical notes uh, definitely follow through to the palate. Again, we're talking guava, mango, passion fruit, um, you know, a little bit of ripe grapefruit. Um, and then that oak, that just, it's just a mouthfeel. It's super round. It feels like a little, like it gives it a little creaminess, uh, you know, not creamy like malolactic fermentation or anything like that, but just just that kind of round weighted uh, on, on the palate. It's just really beautiful. Mm. Oh, Michael wants a sip, so I'm gonna just pass this over. So next, Chardonnay. Chardonnay all day. Um, and so is there any better for you when you drink high acidity with food? Um, I don't know. I guess I never really thought of that, but maybe that's something that I should try. Yeah, Amy, saliva down your shirt once. I know it's the worst. It's literally like the worst. <laughs> but you know what? The things that we do, the things that we do to learn about wine is 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 whatever. That that's just how we are. Shinene, uh, shinarnade day. Um, okay, so let me tell you what, guys. Before I even get into my notes, I'm gonna end this whole. Napa Valley only makes heavy, buttery, oaky Chardonnay, and it's flabby, and it's and it's heavy, and it's blah, and it, that, okay? Maybe in the 80s, when that was, like, first super popular, and that's what everyone's palate wanted, and it did, okay, it did hang out for a while in Napa, but things are changing now, um, and we're finding in Napa Valley gorgeous expressions of Chardonnay. They're, um, they're, less, they're, they're not anything like that. Yes, do they see malolactic fermentation? Yes. Do they see some oak? Yes, but, but so does Chardonnay and Burgundy, right? So we're, we're seeing Chardonnay, um, we're, we're seeing Chardonnay, sorry, I'm holding the Sauvignon Blanc. We're seeing Chardonnay really lighten up and really become more approachable um, for everybody. And so it's really, really exciting to see. Um, and so let's see, someone just said, acidity with the right vegetarian dishes can actually help to cut through some of the more bitter green. Absolutely. Um, asparagus, I know that's a really hard, uh, hard vegetable to pair, but I think for me, um, I do like a good Sauvignon Blanc with nice city with some of that really, really green vegetables, so totally. 
Um, so here's the Chardonnay. And like I said, you know, we're, we're going away from what we used to know Napa Valley Chardonnay is. So here we have fermentation in 100% French oak, surly, which means what? On the lease, uh, which are dead yeast cells. Uh, we're aging for eight months in 33% new barrel and 67% French neutral barrels. So we're not oak bombing this because 67% is in aging in a neutral barrel, okay? It's seeing 33% 30, 30, new. You gotta, you gotta take these notes when you're at the store, right? And it says it on the back here. I know that my light is like screwing it up, but you know, and that'll, that'll also help you gauge whether or not you're gonna, you're gonna love it. Um, and it's 18% malolactic fermentation. So 18%, that's it. So malolactic fermentation is when you're taking tart malic acid and you're changing it to more of a lactic acid. So you think lactic, you think milk, right? You think uh, butter and cream. And so that is where we're saying like, oh, Napa Chardonnay back in the day was so buttery. Well, here we're talking 18% malolactic, so it's not that at all. It might have like a nice fresh creme to it, but it's not gonna have just like a butter bomb. Um, so that's important to know when you're shopping for Napa Valley Chardonnay. This is, this is excellent. This is important stuff and I'm such a nerd. Okay, so let's, let's have a sip here. First of all, the color is beautiful. So we went from kind of like a pale lemon to like a pale, uh, to almost like a medium gold. Um, mm. On the nose, we have some nice ripe stone fruit. So you have some ripe peach. Uh, we have some, a little bit of pear, a little bit of apricot. Um, there's some ripe orange melon here. Um, and there, there is a little bit of like, like a nice toasty caramel, but just slightly. Uh, you know, it's important to know when when you are blinding or if you're taking your exam, you wanna know if the wine has seen oak, what are the things you can look for? Um, and so if you get like a little bit of toasty caramel or like a little bit of vanilla or nutmeg or, or anything like that, uh, you can probably bet that the wine has seen some oak. So I'm not smelling I'm not smelling like this big bowl of butter uh, at all. It smells very fresh, um, almost a little flinty, um, which is great. Ooh, beautiful acidity again. Um, not as high as the Sauvignon Blanc, but definitely we're hitting medium, medium plus. Um, we have again, those nice ripe stone fruits carrying through, uh, peach, apricot, um, a little bit of pear. Again, uh, you get this kind of, a little bit of baking spice in there, a little bit of like, a little bit of toasty oak, uh, just a teeny bit. And you have a beautiful weight again to the palate. It feels nice and round to the mouth, um, but you have this like really nice balanced acidity that really just lifts the whole wine. It takes all the fruit and just lifts it right up. Um, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, I would I would pair this with like um, a seafood pasta and like a cream sauce or even like a grilled chicken in a cream sauce, any kind of cream. Um, this would be really, really good for if you did like a, a rosemary crusted chicken or like a full like uh, I don't know, like a full bone-in chicken thigh. I'm like been really on those lately. I've been cooking those a lot. Uh, this would be excellent. And I really think like a lot of those herbs like thyme and, and um, sage or any of those like green herbs, rosemary, uh, would all bounce off of this in, in a really beautiful way. Uh, so it would be an excellent wine um, and I'm gonna pass that over to Michael because that's just how it goes in our house. He likes to taste all the wines too, which is good. Um, crab cakes, yes, I love it. Some crab cakes with that orange kind of, um, this is like a rumlaud or I'm not, I'm actually not sure what they put 
<laughs> the orange sauce, I don't know what that it's sauce spicy. is. It's like a spicy remoulade or something that they put on your fried crab cakes. That would be so good right now. Like, I'm here for that. Lobster, I'm here for that. Uh, yeah, some lobster and like lobster and butter because that little bit of malolactic that this went through, I think would pull it and kind of just complement it like beautifully. Uh, definitely. Um, it's aioli. That's all. Aioli. 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 Okay, so we're almost to the giveaway. I'm so excited. Okay, but the last thing we have to talk about is what they're known for. Not what they're known for, but you know what I'm saying. Um, cake bread, chicken, shellfish, seafood, and grilled salads. Yes, all of the above. I'm on it. So good. Okay, so we're going to talk about this baby here. And uh, you know what's crazy is that um, I actually just broke my Corvid needle. So I hope I didn't ruin the wine. Uh, has anyone else broken a Corvid needle? I'm, I'm waiting to get some more, and I, I hope that um, it still worked, but it sounded really funny, so I really hope I didn't get any oxygen in the wine. I'm not sure. Um, but I know, I can't believe I broke the needle. It's my only one. I'm down in North Carolina without all my wine supplies. <laughs> Son, help. Um, okay, so here we are. Cabernet. This is, this is the, um, the great daddy of Napa Valley. <laughs> that was really funny. I just made that up. <laughs> great daddy. Um, okay, so here we are. We're talking 83% Cabernet Sauvignon, 9% Merlot, 4% Petit Verdot, 4% Cab Franc. What? So how does it say Cabernet Sauvignon? Well, if you guys didn't know, uh, varietal label laws say that the blend must be 75% of one grape to be labeled with that variety. So while in other parts of the world, like Elsa's, I don't know, sometimes I just talk about French regions because it's, it's on the brain. If you label a wine with that variety, it has to be 100% that variety of varietal wine. In Napa Valley, the ABA rule states the blend must be 75% of one grape. So having this be 83% caps off, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and you'll find across all of Napa Valley, it is all very much the same. And it's awesome because it allows the winemaker to, to pull things to really create a gorgeous expression of, of, of what this wine should be. So, you know, just that 4% Petit Verdot, as I said, Add a little bit of spice and a little black fruit. Um, Cabernet, a little bit of uplift with some red berry. Merlot, a little bit of plumminess. You know, these are all things that really, really make Cabernet Sauvignon uh, a beautiful, a beautiful one. So it's important to know um, if the Corvin fell, just open and drink it. So actually, that's probably going to be the plan. Um, and <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, Okay, so this wine right here, aged for 17 months, 56% new French oak, 44% neutral oak. Um, the 2017 vintage was marked by ideal growing conditions uh, and temperatures re resulting in really um, uh, concentrated flavors. So when when you see people say, "Oh, it's it was you know it was ideal growing conditions," what does that really mean? Um, you know. We say, we say these things uh, to, to mark a vintage year of just, you know, maybe we're not dealing with frost, we're not dealing with hail, we're not dealing with too much rain and cloud cover, you know, ideal conditions, you know, you have a dry, sunny afternoons and cool nights, um, you know, we're not dealing with rot or, or you know, early, early spring frost or late fall uh, frost, you know, Cabernet needs that heat, it's a late ripening grape. Uh, so you, you get just a nice, perfect season. Um, you know, I've read a lot about, you know, I heard 2017 is supposed to be great. Obviously, this wine is such a baby. Uh, I would recommend you guys buy two Cabernets from Cake Bread. Open one now. See what it tastes like. I mean, there's no better way to learn the evolution of wine than to taste it when it's a baby 
and then taste it in 10 years if you can wait. Um, I have a really hard time waiting. Uh, so my plan is to drink this one now because Corbin failed. Uh, and uh, which by the way, I love Corbin. Don't get, don't get it twisted. Love Corbin, I just need a new needle. Um, and, and you know, hopefully we'll, I'm gonna get one and, and put it in my cellar and, and pull that baby out 10 years, maybe on an anniversary. Who knows, you know, this is really special wine. So you, you, don't, you don't necessarily wanna just get one, pop it open and bam. If you want to, that's your prerogative, but it really makes sense to buy two. One for now, one for later. And that is how you learn about tertiary notes. You know, you talk about tasting and, and blinding wines. You talk about primary flavors, secondary flavors, um, tertiary flavors. And tertiary is when you, you start getting into that kind of leather and, and earth and meatiness. And, and the wine starts going away from that primary fruit. And it starts changing into something and evolving into something totally different. And it's so cool to understand it. Um, and it's also so important to understand it. So, hmm. it's nice. <laughs> I only had a few sips today too. It seems like I'm drunk. I swear to God, I'm not. Hmm. Okay. Man, I miss Napa. Okay. Blackberry, black cherry, black plums. Maybe a little bit, of, they're a little bit cooked. Um, Cassis, uh, leather, but not in the tertiary sense. If that makes sense, like, it, like when you smell fresh leather, um, just kind of like out of the bag type of thing. Uh, tobacco leaf, a little menthol, some nutmeg, some vanilla, a little cigar box. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on. Uh, this has medium plus acidity, a full body. Um, tannin structure is is quite, quite high. High. And it makes sense, this is a young Cabernet, 2017. So uh, for those who don't know, we talk about tannin, 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 tannin. Um, for those of you who are just starting to wine, tannin is a mouth drying sensation. It's when you take a sip of wine and all of a sudden, you know, your cheek is stuck to the top of your gum um, and you're like, Oh my God, everything's dry. Uh, that's from the tannins. And so my favorite thing to do in New York City, um, Michael and I, is we like to go to those really old classic steakhouses, Old Homestead, Peter Luger's Club A, uh, Club a Steakhouse, which is probably one of the most underrated steakhouses in all of New York. Take note, like old school, like red carpet type of thing. Um, and there's nothing better than going to these classic legendary steakhouses and just ordering a killer Napa Valley Cabernet with your tomahawk, your porterhouse for two, your New well, York bring strip. Your bring your own, but also, you know, sometimes we do call ahead for the cork fee. We can bring right. our own cake bread, but it's also good to support wineless. So don't always do that. Um, and and so the reason why, if you guys, if you guys know why it is that Napa Cabernet is just magic uh, with steaks. It's because, uh, and I know that Jacqueline and, and John talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago, but there is um, a, a compound in, in tannins, right? Um, let me try to explain this and not get like too into it. So when you're eating a steak, um, there's actual proteins in the steak that the tannins cling to. So instead of the saliva in your mouth that's drying your mouth out, it instead is gonna cling to the proteins in the steak and, it's, and the steak is able to break down, those proteins in the steak are able to break down the tannin. So it makes the wine feel like velvet in your mouth. And that is why it is the perfect pairing. Not to mention when you crumble that amazing rock salt over the top of your steak, which I all know, I know all of you love that nice crumbled ch -ch -ch rock salt on your steak. We also know that uh, rock salt, salt and tannin are also great for each other. The, the salt makes the uh, tannic wine appear more fruity, uh, fuller bodied, um, and, and a little less harsh, less bitter. So between those proteins in the meats and the rock salt or whatever kind of salt, saltiness 
and sauce or whatever else you put on the top, that is why it is just heaven. So I hope that I talked you guys into getting some of this wine. Um, thank you, Michael. He literally yeah. just drank almost my whole glass. Um, it's a good thing that we are opening the bottle. Um, so I just want to read a couple of the, the Cabernet is so good. It's one of the best to get for dinner. Um, open one up in preparation for a post dinner glass for dessert. Uh, accompaniment, amazing. Um, and my friend, wonder, wonderful mommy, you're so right about this. Always a Napa cab when steakhouse perfection. Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> we do really eat and drink well. We love it. That's, that's probably what I miss most about New York is just the culinary scene, the food and wine scene. It's just everything is so curated and so when you start learning more about wine and what you love about wine you can start finding the foods that really complement it and listen you don't need to always follow the rules i say drink what you want and eat what you want and if that works for you then do it you know you don't always have to follow the rules but sometimes when you have that just magic pairing sometimes there's just no turning back and so when you find those places where you have those moments, you know, you just keep kind of going back to them. So that is definitely something I really miss in New York. Um, and hopefully, and hopefully we can get back there sooner than later. Um, so now it is time to pick the giveaway because courtesy of Cake Bread Sellers, we're giving away a hundred dollar Visa gift card, which is awesome because you can buy some cake bread wine. Um, or maybe Things are a little bit rough right now and you just could use it for something that, you know, is really would be really helpful during this time. So I thought it was like super courteous and generous of them to do something like that. So without further ado, let's have a look here. So I'm going to pull my little iPad number generator. I have all of you guys out um, on my spreadsheet here and I'm going to generate number 32. So, number 32, is the Blonde Bordeaux here? Blonde Bordeaux, I'll give you guys a minute. Okay, yeah, I am not missing any snow in upstate New York. I'm actually from Rochester, so I've seen my parents post about that, no thanks. Blonde Bordeaux, are you here? I'll give you like a second. Um, what part of upstate are you coming from? I have a lot of friends in Syracuse too also, and Buffalo is where I went to college. So I'm, I'm kind of like really connected to that whole I'm from sec section. And Michael is from Saratoga, near, near like George kind of ish over there. Uh, Blonde Bordeaux, I don't see is here. So we are gonna go ahead and Saratoga Springs. Yes, that's where Michael's from. Generate. 16. Let's see who number 16 is. Wino on a budget. Is my girl Chelsea here from Wino on a budget? Oh, you went to Brockport. So my stepmom teaches at Brockport College, teaches ballet. So I'm not sure if you took ballet, but if you did, she might have been your teacher. Um, Wino on a budget. Are you here, darling? Oh, also sometimes when I drink wine, I like to speak with an English accent. Why no want a budget? Why no want a budget? Okay, next, next, generate. Number 49. Hey, Jay Rose, I know I was saying that during your giveaway too. I was like, next, I wanna win. Number 49, by the stem. She's out. Is my girl Cass still here? By the stem, are you here, Cass? She was on there. My roommate did dance, I did theater. No way! Ask her if she knows Miss Marianne. If she knows Miss Marianne, that's my stepmom. Is by the stem here still? Oh man, she was there too, she was. All right, next. Number 12, number 12, number 12. Um, I know she was here. By the stem was here. She was commenting. All right. Uh, Emily Yay, Yay Lime. I don't know if I said that right. 
E M I L I Y A Y I L I M E. She's stemless now. <laughs> that was funny. Emily Yeh. By <laughs> she's stemless. Emily Yeh Lime. She. And this person, if you're here, I know you tagged a bunch of people. Where do I get my wines? That is a great question. Um, I like to shop local uh, if I can. So I like to shop at places like Morel Wine Co., um, Verve Wine, uh, Bottle Rocket, um, Aster Wines, Chamber Street Wines, Flatiron Wines, um, Empire. but Empire Seda Wine, but... Uh, Wine.com sometimes is just fantastic. And they're actually doing a stewardship program where you pay $50 and you and that's your yearly membership and you get free shipping. So I highly recommend it if you order a lot of wine and you can get cake bread sellers right on there. Um, so Astro Wines is doing free shipping for your first order. That's great to know. All right, so we're gonna pick somebody else. Which cake bread wine a favorite in your home? Ooh, we love the Cabernet. I mean, it's just so quintessential. Number 45, number 45. 